If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Today's guest is Rebecca Thomas. Rebecca's a keen three-day event rider. She's an accredited level two coach and she's a competitor. She's also an educator and she's educator. She's a chief coach at Wollaston Pony Club. She's head trainer for the Western Australia Mounted Police. She also teaches at Murdoch University and um, teaches in the animal studies in the equine unit, as well as some EA introductory coaches. And adding all that into a busy life, Beck's also an FEI technical delegate for eventing. How are you today, Beck? I'm fine, Glennis. Thanks. I should just clarify that I'm no longer with the police force. I left that career a few years ago, but mm-hmm. hopefully the training programs that I established there are, are still in place today. I believe they are. I'm sure you did a wonderful job when you were there, so that's good to know anyway. Now, Beck, what's your favourite quote? Can you tell us about that? I do have a favourite quote. My second passion, apart from horses, is literature, Mm -hmm. and that's my area of teaching. I've got a diploma in education, so I'm also a qualified secondary high school teacher in in English and media. So the quote that I've always enjoyed is by Rolf Waldo Emerson. It's quite a long quote, but the final lines, I guess, sum it up, and some of you, I'm sure your listeners will be familiar with it. And the final line is, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. And this applies to horses and humans, and it's really pertinent to all teachers. And it's usually a quote that I, I say at our um, Pony Club wind-up every year. I'm sure everybody is uh, sick of it, but it just means that we're all here to help each other uh, and, you know, make the world a better place. And for us, it's uh, teaching people and horses. Mm. Mm, I think that's one that a lot of aspiring instructors can take and work on that and remember that, yeah. Beck, how did you start with horses? What were your earliest memories there? I grew up in Queensland, uh, a small rural property there, and I had two older brothers, and so riding, we had a couple of horses and we would ride there together, and I I think my memories uh, have a I remember an incident of my brother legging me up to, onto a horse bareback and throwing me right over the other side of the horse. <laughs> and he, they, they was, he was 10 years older than me and I was probably, I don't know, about four, I guess, at that time. So I just remember growing up pretty carefree there with horses and just being very determined to try and do things myself, probably trying to keep up with my brothers, I suppose. I suppose I, you know, became the quintessential tomboy in that way. And then we moved to Western Australia when I was five and my parents bought me a pony. And then that's when I started Pony Club at Wollaston Pony Club when I was seven. And yeah, and I've been actually back coaching there since 1998 and I've been the chief coach there for over 10 years. So I've not moved far from home there, but it's a really lovely community there and it's nice to give back and be involved with the the young riders again. It's lovely to know that the club that you started with, you know, that that it's that particular club that you're giving back to. It's really good. Whereabouts in Queensland, Beck? In Samford, which I believe now is a bit more built up and a bit, uh, you know, quite a nice area. I haven't been back there, but when we grew up, it was all dairy farms that were being sort of cut up into uh, smaller properties. So it was yeah, it was it was pretty open and sort of remote then. But, you know, they were the days you could just go and ride for miles and miles and miles and, you know, out in the bush. It was great. Mm, mm. There's been quite a few dairy farms cut up there now and they're, you know, small sort of five-acre blocks. Yes, the photos I've seen of it, yes, yeah, suggest that. And it still looks a nice place. But, yes, it certainly doesn't seem to look like that in uh you know, 1970. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep, for sure. All right, now you've done quite a lot with horses. You've had a career in the police force. So are you teaching now? 
in the police force, do you no, mean? No, or no, just no. Te- or teaching, because just... you said you're a high school teacher as well. Are you working, oh, yes, I... yeah. Are you working with horses or are you teaching? What's what's What are you doing now? Well, I've got a few hats, Glennis. My advice certainly to the young people I work with is to always create opportunities for yourself. You've got, always got to have options. Mm. So... I did some relief teaching. I didn't I didn't apply for a permanent position as a teacher because I'd just done 22 years in the police force and didn't really want another full-time government or <laughs> full-time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. job for one organisation. But what it, it enabled me to do was really open some doors and opportunities for me so that I guess I have, under the umbrella of education, I my working life consists of using my Level 2 and teaching private lessons, clubs, obviously working with uh, EWA as a coach educator and then my other hat of going at Murdoch University in animal science and teaching a couple of equine units there and then also at Murdoch University where I obtained my diploma of education, I am an external lecturer and I go in and facilitate workshops for the education students. So I have a second year education unit there, which is sort of based on how we learn and learning processes and learning theory, which actually ties in really nicely with the equine learning theory Mm. that I've did quite a lot with in relation to police horses and took me on that journey with Andrew McLean. So uh, everything dovetails quite nicely, education and horses together. So it's um, a, a lovely variety of work, but still within that area of interest that I really enjoy. So even though you, your main career started off in the police force, it's like you had a secondary career with the horse industry. What sort of advice would you give to people who want to work in the horse industry? That's a good question um, because it's pretty tough. You have to self-educate. You have to find an area that you're interested in because, as we all know, that we have to get up and work every day. And, you know, some days uh, are harder than others. But if it's an area of work that you enjoy, then you're going to feel that you have a purpose and you're going to get some enjoyment out of doing that. So you need to find an area within the horse industry that you're interested in, whether it's breeding or exercise physiology or um, athlete management of high performance, which is also quite an interesting area if you're interested in sort of psychology path. Um, Of course, then you have just working within the industries of racing or, um, you know, the professional riders, for example. But I think you need to get out and meet lots of people. You need to have create opportunities for yourself that way and through education so that you can make informed choices, you know, as you kind of go down that path, I think, because it is a difficult industry and a lot of people want to work in it. So that that would be what I would sort of say to young people. Okay. And what about for people who do want to work in it? What sort of core skills or character traits would they need to have? You know, even if you're going to recommend someone for a job, what sort of things are you looking at? It's very similar um, qualities, actually, that I was looking at when I designed the pre-selection course for police officers wanting to come into the mounted police. And I think any all of your horse riders or horse people listening will agree that you have to have resilience because there are so many things outside of your control because you're dealing with an animal. You need endurance. You need to just keep going, be able to put your head down and put one foot in front of the other and keep going because the days are long and it's very physical. Be prepared to listen to others and accept advice and instruction from those people to learn as much as you can because, you know, it is an area, you know, horses uh, that we're constantly learning and you can't be closed-minded in in any way to your view. So you always, always listen to others, take on board whether you agree, disagree. So you keep learning all the time. But you've got to be tough and resilient and you've got to want to do it and get your hands dirty, I think. Yep. Yeah. And what about through your career? What sort of people have influenced you? I know you've said about Andrew, uh, and I'll, t- I'll come to you a bit later about Andrew, because I want to ask you a bit about the work that you were doing with him. But apart from Andrew, who else has influenced you? For those people in WA, they'll be familiar with um, had a coach, as many people did, called Heather Larwood, who uh, was quite instrumental in the very early days of eventing in Australia and uh, when she came out from England and settled in WA. And so as young people, we would go to um, we would go to camps, summer camps, five-day camps uh, up at 
or certainly we did up at Wandawi on a farm, which was pretty tough, where we would do flat work and cross-country and jumping, and it would be very hot, and we would start early, and we'd work really hard, and that's the sort of resilience and endurance thing, I suppose, and we learnt a lot. And she was a very good horsewoman as well, you know, just how the horse is, how the horse thinks, very compassionate towards the horse, um, and really learnt a lot of things about the horse as an animal that probably... We is a bit lacking today because we don't really work with horses anymore, you know, as in farming or any of those utilitarian ways. She was very good like that. And, you know, we had good coaches at Pony Club that were um, imaginative, you know, active riding the Prince Philip Games and always really encouraging everyone to be involved and to you to keep going and, uh, and very supportive and encouraging. So it looked probably all those people in my younger years that, you know, established you. And so therefore I, we went down the eventing path because you can do everything, um, mm. <laughs> which like, yep. like I think of an event venter is a big, an event horse is like a big pony club horse. You know, you can kind <laughs> of go out and do a variety. Yes, yes. <laughs> a variety of things as in, for example, my event horse then, we did a ride to Cal- Mundaring to Kalgoorlie, which is in for WA's bicentenary year in 1988. It was five. 150 odd kilometres over 13 days, and we just rode the horses we had. And mine was my event horse, and um, I don't know if I'd do that today on them, but uh, you know, you just sort of just got involved with everything. Yes, yeah, yeah. And you talked about Heather being compassionate and getting you to understand the horses. Do you think that was the first time you sort of developed that awareness, or you already had it? Had- uh, yes, it would have been. Um, she was tough on humans. Don't worry about that. But then that <laughs> made you more resilient. Look, it was because then, you know, as your journey continues and learning and then through eventing as a discipline, then meeting Andrew and learning the science behind it, because that's what Heather was teaching us, it all made sense. Yes. And it was good to know, to reflect on the fact that we actually had a really good grounding in being horsemen and women, you know, because we learnt about the horse and what was important in the context of training. Mm -hmm. And it was ethical, you know, and it was clear and it wasn't hurried. Yep, yep, yep. And then when you were working with Andrew, was that with the police force? Yes. Yes, that's where I met him through Portland Jones, who had a, a long-standing relationship with horses and training, and with the McLeans and the learning theory system and that sort of thing. And she introduced me to him. It was about the same time that I got asked. I was a detective sergeant, and uh, so I worked as a detective most of my career. And then I got asked to come to the WA Mounted Police to review, rewrite, um, find out really if they were still relevant for modern policing and to, to write training programs, selection programs and sort of make put everything down in a formalised manner and accountable and transparent way. And so I, you know, got introduced to Andrew then because I thought, well, this is a really good way of starting and so I worked a couple of years really on that and that's how our relationship started and I worked closely with him both here and in Victoria, developing that training program. Mm-hmm. It was very good, very, very good. And, um, yeah, so that that's where I've – and I have known them ever since. So that would have been 2007. So if you, you know, just pulling out – because you would have used the, that system then taken it across to your own horses, what's a key learning? If you think if there's one thing that I learnt or one, you know, one main thing that comes to mind or two or three, you know, just to give – people a bit of an idea about, you know, the system that he's using, the training system, which has been developed from learning theory. Yeah, of course. And, you know, it gives us the science that explains what good trainers have been doing. I mean, Tom Roberts was doing it, you know. Mm, Yes. This is, and the good top riders are actually doing this, even if they can't give it a name, because, um, so really, it's about being patient and clear when training the horse and, particularly with the police horses and then, of course, with the venting because of the cross-country and things like that, the biggest thing was that you're dealing with a flight animal and so the biggest tip with training your horse to do anything is to delete any expressions of the flight response Mm -hmm. as as quickly as possible and to always train so that your responses are reduced to a light aid. 
you know, that means the horse's life will be good, it will be pain-free, develop self-carriage. So really always develop, you know, the aids so they're light, make it clear and be patient. Don't use punishment, it has no place for training the mm-hmm. horse mm-hmm. because you've got to teach him how he learns, just like us, you know, and that's why teaching teachers to be teachers and teaching children and teaching humans, it's the same because we all, training takes as long as it takes for each of us as individuals and you can't punish and you can't create fear and you have to, so it's up to you to, you know, your responsibility as a teacher is a very big one and that is, you know, to create an environment that encourages learning and is free of fear and anxiety. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the horse can then develop confidence and become more confident within the train, look forward to the training. Exactly. That's that's exactly right. It is not a realm to be fearful in, uh, you know, and they're very good at being, you know, having a context mm. that they've mm. learnt fear in. And then you avoid things like overfacing them, you know, rushing the training, yep. you know, having unrelenting mouth pressures and spur marks, you know, all those bad abusive things that as an official and, and as a, a coach, you know, of course we, um, our job, you know, the preamble of, the rules is safety of rider and welfare of the horse. Mm, mm, mm. And that's what we compete under, so that's what we should train under. Yes. Yep. All right. What about a horse? A, a horse who's influenced you? Well, all horses do, don't they? Well, it's, yeah, it, you're right. <laughs> you're right. I mean, each horse teaches you something different about yourself mm. and your training and you as a rider and develops all that. I think mean, it's the great thing. You know, the more you ride, the better chance you have of developing yourself as a rider and the more training challenges you have, the more you develop a deeper knowledge, you know, of that particular aspect. If everything goes well all the time and you're just a passenger and, you know, yes, <laughs> yes. you don't learn as much as if you have a training challenge yep. and you have to unpack it, you know, don't you? To, I mean, yep. it can be frustrating. But then, of course, as a coach, when you're, it makes you very good at being able to problem solve, analyze a problem, think of the best way to solve it, you know, how you then troubleshoot issues, you know, with other riders or who you're teaching because you, it's like, oh, I've, okay, I've come across this one before, yes. right, okay, I've, I've got it, I know a little bit about this. Mm-hmm. And so really the, the best horse, I mean, had lots of, not lots, but, you know, they, they all teach us something. But the horse that gave me the most opportunities and experiences was the last two-star horse I had that I did three trips over east and competed at Sydney and Melbourne and was successful in WA and I actually got him. It was quite good because I could practice all my learning theory stuff that I was learning at the police force with him because he was particularly tricky and nervous and a bit anxious and you had to do lots of repetitions and you couldn't rush him, you know. And so, yeah, it was very good because I had a horse that I could just keep practicing this stuff on. Yes. But I sort of had to because he had, you know, a bit of baggage. And, of course, he turned out well and it gave me lots of great experiences. And that's really then what led me, once I became an FEI rider, of course, I was introduced into that world and then that's when the technical delegate work became and I got to work with FEI, you know, course designers and other technical delegates and judges. And I thought, oh, this this is interesting. And really... The horse I had opened all those doors. If I hadn't have made those trips and competed at that level, wouldn't have really been part of that and known about it. And I mean, you know, to that extent. And so that was important. That horse was important in a lot of ways, and not just the riding accomplishments. And that was debonair, wasn't it? Oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you didn't Steve say. You did. Debonair. You didn't say. So I presumed. <laughs> So yes, 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 yes. So really, that horse—it was it's interesting. If you look at it, it, it sort of brought all the proponents of for coaching. What I was learning, you mm. know, we talk about the learning theory, tied that in, and of course, it took me into the FEI and then the officiating, and and then learning more about, you know, now having a tricky horse and having to do things a certain way. So it was very, very interesting. And then, of course, the end result was a, a harmonious partnership that, you know, was great fun. Yep, yep. And what do you think your proudest moment's been? Well, riding to Kalgoorlie when, Good. I was, yes. when I was 18, you know, that was a, that was a big trip. I was, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was a big trip. And uh, coming fifth at Melbourne and the, the last trip I did with Debonair then, fifth at Melbourne, 
in the two star finishing on your dressage score and going, gee, that's pretty good. And 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 the added bonus, I had my two best friends with me who supported me and came with me, and so we sort of all did it together. And um, yeah, that that was pretty good. Yeah, that that yeah, was pretty yeah, good, pretty yeah. special. Mm. Yeah, good. Wait, can you hear anything? No, that's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats.com, and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right. Now, putting on your coach's cap, we've sort of talked a little bit about um, the training that you were doing with the police force or with the, the mounted police. What do you think is a common problem that you see, you know, with riders, with coaches, just a common problem, but also how to fix that problem? A common problem, I mean, general problems, I guess, are, are always that people want to get there faster and yep. maybe the horse is ready for, okay, and we all agree with that because you, you all know, and I think eventing is, it's one of those levelers, isn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> because, yeah, yes. You know, if your training's not good, there is at some point where the wheels will fall off because it has to jump over obstacles. You, yes. you know what I mean? Like yes. you have to make sure you dot your I's and cross your T's because it will at some stage, whether it's, you know, at 95 centimetres or two star or three star or, you know, whatever, yep. it, there'll be a time. So you have to do everything you can. Um, I think I like riders that spend the time to feel and learn what their horse is doing, to think about how to fix it, to seek, the the advice to do that so that we do remain within this sort of ethical and sustainable coaching framework. Oh, look, I think contact is a big thing. I always like, you know, that the horse has got to be, you know, that the bit is a severe thing, that yeah, piece of metal, isn't it, that sits in that soft yep. mouth. And you have to be so careful and you have to develop that well. And just getting the fundamental basics first before then moving to the next level because, and then this is, happens with the police horse training exactly the same. If you haven't got all the buttons working under pressure at home in the arena or as we would have, you know, at the stables, there's no point in going to Northbridge on a Saturday night because yeah. they're only going to, you know, deteriorate under pressure. So there's no point in trying to go and do cross country or do you know, things that the horse is not ready for because you just can't have that discussion with it and it's not going to be a good experience for the horse. And if he has a good experience, he's only going to get better and, and your training will be better. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not one problem that, you know, I think people, people have different reasons for doing the sport, I suppose, but you just have to be patient and have resilience, <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the again. face of adversity. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Now, Beck, have you got a book that you could recommend for people, training book, something to just complement their riding and their training and what they're doing? Well, there's a couple here I've, I sort of like and I and I do refer to. And, of course, anyone, the Tom Roberts books are really fantastic to have a look at. And I, even though they're an older style, well, they're an old book, it doesn't matter how old they are, you know, training horses has a fundamental you know, foundation and base is that, you know, younger people should be looking at those. And then that flows in very well to Andrew's academic horse training, which really does break it down. It's quite a helpful book in looking and at training. Kira Kirkland's, she has a really good dressage book, Dressage with Kira. So Kira Kirkland is good. And then I, there's a terrific, if you're in a, for the eventers out there, if you want a comprehensive, great Christmas present for the young eventer, <laughs> if you're looking at something, um, Philip Dutton's Modern Eventing came out only just a couple of years ago, is really comprehensive. And, of course, he's an Aussie, and uh, even though he's in America now, but uh, he, yeah, it's a really good book. Okay. So there's just a couple of different ones for people with the different interests. Okay, good. Good. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. Now, you've got a young horse now? You're bringing yes, on? Yes, you I do. Yep, yep. So, I do. So what are you looking forward to? You're looking forward to the young horse? What about riders? Have you got any, any riders coming along that you're teaching? I have a lovely group of riders that I teach, mm -hmm. um, well, you know, clients, mostly younger, which I enjoy, the 
ones from Pony Club and then I also give them individual lessons and um, they're interested in eventing mostly is um, being able to get this, I guess, this foundation training, the, you know, teaching them all learning theory, teaching them how the horse is, trying to, I guess, impart that good horsemanship that, you know, Heather gave me, but now I can sort of talk about it more scientifically because I've got a bit more knowledge so that they all learn from a really early age that this is the right way to train your horse. Yep. And they're going really well and they're a pleasure to teach because they re- they find it really interesting because it unpacks why things happen and how to fix them. So they feel more empowered because they actually know how to fix something mm-hmm. because you can break it down. So I do. I, I've got lots of sort of younger riders, which I love because if they can really have a good foundation, they'll take that then into their adult years and hopefully they'll you know, remember it and they'll find it useful. Yep. Yeah, yeah, find yeah. it useful. That's really good. Really. So good. Um, anyway, hopefully one or one or two of them will go. <laughs> to now then, then I can go with them. All right, all right. Now, can you sum up, before we say goodbye, sum up your philosophy into a lesson today, something that people can take away with them? Well, I would say as a a rider and a coach, be patient, do the right thing by your horses and pupils, support and encourage them, I think, you know. It's up to you to find the best way to teach them. And I always think teach them how you would like to be taught, You know, don't use punishment, be patient, find a way to get them to understand. Actually, there's a good friend of mine is an equine vet and she says within their oath, there's a statement that says, if you can't do good, then do no harm. And I sort of like that because if you train correctly and ethically, then you're going to build that trusting partnership with your horse. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what you want. Yes. Yes. You're a team. I, I would sort of say to people that leaving the start box at a three-day event is just like going into battle <laughs> like a police <laughs> horse, you know, going to Northbridge on a Saturday night. Yep. The two of you better be together because you're just about to embark on, yes. you know, quite a hair-raising, dangerous folly. Mm. So mm. I'd, I'd rather have a, have, a, have a good team member with me. So I think that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? And you only do that through clear and patient training. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Beck, how can people contact you? Look, we, we're going to have your details on horsechats.com slash Rebecca Thomas, but how else, you know, if you can just say now how people can contact you? Oh, well, I don't have a website or anything. I have really my phone number and email or, um, of course, Facebook. Sure. I'm on there. They're really they, – they, that and, seems to work okay. And that's under Rebecca Thomas? That's under Rebecca Thomas. Yep, we'll, we'll put that um, link up. We'll put that yeah. link up on the page as well. Yep. Sure. Okay. All right. Looks in great talking to you today, Beck. Really enjoyed it. I um, enjoyed hearing about the um, training with the police horses particularly and, you know, the work you were doing there, even though you're not doing the work now. You know, as you say, if you've put the things in place that they can carry on, then that's um, – you've sort of made your mark there and put systems in place. And if they're carrying on without you, that's even better so you can go on and do bigger and better things yourself. Yes, well, that's right. Let's hope so. I think it's all going well. And I, yeah, look forward to, you know, a new future doing all the education and horse-related activities that I can. (laughs) Okay. All right. Thanks very much for talking today. Bye. Thanks, Glenis. Bye-bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 